Greetings and welcome to America on Trial, a different kind of court where legal experts analyze a hot potato legal issue. And today on trial is nobody else but President Biden and his offer of student loan forgiveness. Will it work or will it take us closer to socialism? So Adam, probably it would be the first legal expert to address it. Um, do you think that it could work? Well, thank you for that question. And let me just make three brief points. First, Biden's action is likely unconstitutional as an executive overreach because Congress has the power of the purse, not the president. Second, this $10,000 debt reduction, even if it's held unconstitutional, really isn't going to help that much. The average graduate student debt is over 70000 The average law school debt is over 145000 The average bachelor's degree debt is over 28000 So the relief it's going to provide is going to be um, more style than substance. Yes, Adam, but, but president or we as society should start somewhere in 10000 or 20000 if it is a Pell Grant recipient's would be a good beginning, don't you think so? We can I'll tell you where we should start. We should start with the government. The government is to blame for the student loan crisis because it has freely and unconditionally given student loans to any student who wants them, regardless of the college that they go to, the quality of that college, the employment outcomes of that, of that college, or the quality of their teachers and their assessments. So that has enabled predatory colleges to take advantage of poor students and middle income students, and it has, has allowed universities to increase tuition threefold while taking these students' money and putting them into six figure, non dischargeable, crushing debt. If Congress wants to solve the problem, it's not a handout. What it is is holding universities accountable by saying you won't get student loans unless you can show that the education and employment outcomes justify the debt that the graduates are incurring. If I can jump in on that point real quick. So the, Adam is right. The colleges and universities are partly to blame for this problem, and the government is partly to blame. They have made these student loans so available, it allowed the co colleges and universities to jack up their tuition, and it has it exponentially increased the cost of a college education. And, and now the same people who got us into this mess are coming back and saying, now we're gonna forgive some of it because we're so nice. I don't buy it. I think uh, it's a complex problem because it is a problem the government created and it is a problem that the government isn't gonna just solve for by forgiving 10,000 bucks worth of debt per person as, as Adam has already explained. Yes, Jeff, but don't you think that uh... Even if government has created this problem, government should take certain accountability in resolving it and maybe um, doing something about it. As Adam mentioned, that it should go straight to Congress and that president does not have such an executive power to use it in that way. But something needs to be done. And for such a long period of time, nothing has been done. And student loans has been a sexy topic on um, everyone's mind. So where should we go? What, what should be done then? Well, let, let me suggest first that I agree with you. I am skeptical that the president has the constitutional authority to unilaterally uh, declare certain uh, uh, notes owing to the federal government null and void. Uh, I, I think that requires an act of Congress. Um, now, I don't know that that exact question has ever been litigated, but it seems to me that the president's overreached trying to do this with executive action. So what should be done? Should president do nothing? Uh, I, I think that the first thing I would do, which as far as I know, nobody has, is address the problem at the source, the availability of excessive amounts of, of student loans uh, allowing people to run up these debts of, that are six figures uh, in magnitude, as Adam has talked about. I think when we, when we first limit the amount of student loans that are available and maybe uh, do more to make it need-based, well, that, that's a, a beginning point. Uh, I also understand the concerns of people that are saying, hey, we didn't, in, 
you know, we didn't incur these debts. We didn't get the education. Why should we subsidize the people who did? Um, we're, there's four lawyers on this panel. Probably all of us had student loan debt. Uh, but, and, and, you know, would our educations have been less expensive if there hadn't been so much readily available student loan, uh, student loans? So, Fernando, do you have a student loan, student debt? Uh, I do have student loans, and so does my fiance. Um, I guess Jeff was right. You know, and I've been I've been consistently making payments for I don't know how many years now, and the amount has a tendency to stay exactly the same. And one of the first issues, huh? Go ahead, Fernando. This executive order, this plan of um, student loan forgiveness, also incorporated a payment plan that would reduce the required percentage to be paid so and also uh, provide some uh, levies, uh, some flexibility for the people who are paying for it, such as maintaining uh, interest rate at a certain level. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, should, should we maybe choose certain facts incorporated in this uh, student loan forgiveness plan uh, or should it be completely destroyed as Jeff and Adam have mentioned? Well, it shouldn't be destroyed, as Jeff and Adam have suggested, because once you start limiting who can get it, you're going to limit the pool of individuals that go that can go to college, because it really isn't upper middle class children that are getting loans. It's usually lower middle class to lower class children who are taking out loans. I'm not I wasn't lower class, but my university, when I started, the tuition was reasonable and affordable. Um, I had partial scholarships and a bunch of other stuff, but then all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, they quadrupled the tuition. I was forced to take out a loan. Then when I went to law school, the amount of aid and scholarships, the pool is very tiny or not available at all, so then I had to take out loans. Uh, One of the issues that was brought up, whether it's constitutional or not, loan forgiveness has been around since uh, President uh, W, because he started the first loan forgiveness program back in the 90s. So if it was constitutional then, it's going to be constitutional now. And that loan forgiveness program at the time was, was if you got a job in the public sector and you stayed in that job for, I believe it was either three or five years, your entire loan amount was discharged. So somehow it was okay then, but now all of a sudden it's Biden and all he wants to do is take away a measly 10000 off of a $160,000 debt. Now it may or may not be unconstitutional. Also, the income-driven plan that you state at Guidry, that plan has been around since before Biden. Um, and what they do is that they take your income. Uh, I think the current plan, I think it's 10% of your income or something like that. And then you make X amount of payments for X amount of years, whatever the balance is at the end of those at that the end of that year, I think it's 20 years, gets discharged. Um, so discharging loans by the federal government has been around now for quite some time before Biden became president. So, Fernando, if the president, let's say that this plan gets adopted. And um, we are talking about probably $1.6 trillion million industry that incorporates the student loans. Um, That money will be waived or big part of that money will be simply wiped out of the education department books. So who will pay for that? Well, here's the thing. One distinction does need to be made that nobody makes in the media is that there are two types of private loans. There's private loans given out by private banks, and then there's loans sub- given out by the government. The ones given out by private banks have nothing to do with this. It's only going to be the ones given out by the government. And guess what? We're already subsidizing student loans. And the biggest issue with student loans is that the, they fluctuate the interest consistently, so your loan amount stays the same. And that's what makes it so hard to pay it off. When you take out a mortgage on your house you make payments, that debt reduces. My fiance has been paying her student loans consistently for five years. The amount looks exactly the same. And she's already paid about $50,000 to the government. And the amount does not go down. So she'll be paying for 20 years, whatever is left the end of 20 years. 
Suppose you'll get discharged. Adam. With all due respect, Deidre, you are living in fantasy land. And I'll tell you why. $10,000 isn't going to do anything for a law graduate who has an average of $145,000 in non-dischargeable debt. It's going to do nothing for a grad student with $71,000 in debt. It's a drop in the bucket. Now, let me be very clear what the problem is. Originally, Congress's intent in providing student loans was to give opportunities to low-income people to access a college education, and that's a good thing. However, where Congress went wrong is that they allowed every single student who wanted to go to any college, no matter how poor or predatory, to get these loans. So you have students going to the worst undergraduate schools, the worst graduate business schools, the worst graduate law schools, where the employment outcomes are terrible and the average salaries could not possibly justify this crushing debt. And yet they're still giving them all this money. So what happens is the students graduate, they can't pay it back, and they have a one-way ticket to poverty. What Congress needs to do is say, um, we want to give people access to education, but to do it responsibly, you have to hold universities accountable and say, we're only going to give this money if you can show that the graduates' employment outcomes and success justifies that kind of debt. Adam, let me jump in really fast. I agree with what you're saying, but you talked about MBAs and law schools. You know, maybe if these exorbitant uh, uh, student loans were handed out to people going to law school or MBA school, there may be more of a of a justification when you give it to a kid going to wellesley college to major in english lit along with you know and then they run up a six-figure debt uh and essentially have the option after a bachelor's degree of becoming a, a high school teacher or something okay we have not been responsible uh, in helping the kids we've got them into a situation that is untenable well, Jeff, that's exactly what I'm saying. And it does apply to law schools because you and I both know that there are 50 or 60 law schools where employment outcomes are horrible and entering admission statistics are terrible. Yet yeah, we still get these lawyers, schools, I, and it's I ridiculous. We need to hold the, Congress needs to hold these universities accountable and protect these students from predatory and unprincipled universities. Yes, but we are talking about Congress. <laughs> and, 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 the intent of Congress to give access to education is actually, in many cases, having the opposite effect. It is putting people further into poverty. But Adam, you're looking at the stars. You're talking about the Congress. Now we're talking about a student in American high school. There are social workers, there are advisors uh, setting the plans, speaking to schools, helping prepare for all those tests. They have parents. They have. There are a lot of a lot of people incorporated into making the decision, helping for the young person to make a decision to choose the university. How are you helping a young person by putting them in bankruptcy, by putting them with crushing six-figure debt, by allowing them to take loans for universities that don't produce employment outcomes? You oh, wait a minute. Let, let's stop the nonsense about employment. Okay, Adam, let's stop the complete nonsense about tying it to employment opportunities. If that's I'm sorry, the case, a government if that's the case, account if that's it, listen, student lo the reason student loans exist is to pay overpriced professors like yourself. That's the biggest problem, all right? Professors who work three hours a week. I make $65,000 a year. Yes, for three hours of Four work. Four courses a semester. About three so hours I of I work. that week. much money. Okay. You're working three hours a week or one and a half hours per day, two times a week. Huh. All right. The bottom line is that you want to sit here and tie it to this ridiculous notion of getting a job, this, that, and the other. Getting a job depends on where, what area you want to go into. There are plenty of people that graduate law school that want to go into certain areas and they just can't get in for whatever reason because they don't have the connections or because they didn't go they to they didn't go, they didn't go, they didn't go to a white shoe law to a white shoe law school exactly so they're getting blocked out they're getting blocked out from getting those jobs and they're being looked upon they but guys but do, guys yet they every the job Everyone tells people, to, to the new students, to every single person who wants to go to law school, my advice or advice that I hear in all the places around that everyone is echoing the same advice is make sure that you want to do it. 
know that it's going to be expensive and think about it in, in advance. We are talking about adults. We're not talking about children. Okay, well, Guidry, can I give you just that, a very quick solution? Saying, if no, a law on, school is ranked on, in the first year and only 30 percent of the graduates Adam, stop jobs, talking for a second. they'll take like out six figures in loans. Listen, you sound like a Muppet. Fernando, let Adam finish. Bottom, the bottom, and you know, this notion that a kid goes to Wesley and, and gets a degree in, in English lit. Hey, guess what? We need English teachers. And guess what? That, that English lit major, if they go teach at a public school, they're going to end up getting their loans discharged because they have a job in the public sector. Just like a nurse that, that goes and works for, that goes and work for a state and for the U.S. Hospital. All right? We need nurses. You we need English lit majors. We need them all. We may not need overpriced college professors, but we need all we need all the other people. And guess what? Those loans also go to trade schools because we need mechanics, we need plumbers, we need electricians. And there are some kids that can't afford to go to trade school. Trade school sometimes is just as expensive as going to law school. And guess what? Getting a trade sometimes coming out, if you don't get into a union and go sit at the union hall and make connections, you won't get jobs. So now all of a sudden you want to tie it to a job for, to getting jobs when sometimes the area that you're going into is very difficult to get a job because there are other factors that affect it. So you're 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 this thing that you want to tie it to doesn't make any sense. Gidri, just give me 30 seconds to speak to those young people out there. They and don't want to hear here's the solution. The wait, 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 wait. Let's excuse do me, excuse right. me, Fernando. If you get into Harvard or Yale or Cornell or NYU or Chicago or Northwestern, the debt's justified. If you get into a low-ranked law school, a low-ranked MBA program, or a low-ranked undergrad, it's not worth it. Use your common sense. Your future is in your hands, and the government is selling you the bill, a bill of goods, and so are these universities. The best way to get into the middle class is by lowering debt, not having children before you're married, not committing crimes, and saving your money. Okay, Adam. Well, great points have been made here. Jeff, I think you are the one to give us the final statement with your common sense hat. So take it. Three, three problems that haven't really been uh, settled in this episode are one, does the president have the constitutional authority to, through executive action, discharge debt without an act of Congress? I doubt it. I, I don't know that that has ever been directly litigated, but it seems to me that that's an overreach. Secondly, it's a con student loans are a complex problem because one of the reasons they're so high is that they were so easily available and people could borrow so much money, even for degrees that come a dime a dozen and where there are no concrete job prospects available uh, when kids come out of these schools. Now, one could take that and argue, well, we ought to then uh, forgive these debts because we got them into this mess. There's a point there. But finally, I understand the point that all of these people are making about, well, what if I went to trade school and didn't get a student loan? Or what if I, you know, graduated from high school and started my own business and never went to college? Do I have to pay somebody else's tuition? Feels offensive to a lot of people. And I get that too. Thank you. Jeff, thank you for your final statement. It summarizes the best what happened today here. Stay tuned and please leave your comments below. And a hot take of today is pineapple on the trial. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Fernando? Absolutely not. As a New Yorker, where the best pizza in the world exists, it is offensive that they would put pineapple on pizza. Those Canadians lost their minds when they invented the pineapple topping on a pizza. The only thing that should go on on a pizza is either pepperoni, for those of you that like anchovies, anchovies, maybe extra cheese, sausage, maybe some peppers, maybe some onions. Pineapple has no business being on top of a pizza. Adam, Adam, would you agree with that? Would you add pineapple to that pepperoni and anchovy uh, mix and mash? Peter, you should be ashamed of yourself for even asking a question like that. I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to agree with Fernando. I'm from the New York area, too, and the only thing that belongs on pizza is pepperoni. But, Fernando, don't take my agreement to mean that I'll ever agree with you on anything else. Jeff, Jeff, please join my side of this, uh, this argument. What do you think? Look, guys, 
People who don't want pineapple on pizza probably don't like making love either. Ooh. Yeah, it sounds like a lie. But I think okay. Jeff again made a very, very good closing. You always have to bring sex into it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Thank you for watching.